Hello, and welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast, brought to you by the Malfers Group team, where each week we tackle important, actionable topics to help churches thrive. And now, here's your hosts, Scott Ball and AJ Matthew. Well, welcome back to the Church Revitalization Podcast. This is episode 47. My name is AJ Matthew, and joining me as always is my partner in ministry, Scott Ball. Hey, Scott, how are you doing? Howdy. I'm doing all right. It's hot. <laughs> it's, it is summertime in North America. So that's right. Uh, almost anywhere you are, it is hot. Well, we've got another great topic this week, and uh, the title of this week's podcast is How to Raise Your Leadership Ceiling, and so I'm looking forward to getting into this chat here with you, Scott. Uh, The basic principle here stems out of uh, what is known as the Peter Principle. Some people may be familiar with that, others maybe not, but this is basically that your, your level of incompetence will become the ceiling of your leadership capacity. So, um, and a lot of that probably is, it it will be kind of a weird sentence for some people to hear because maybe we think of like, you know, how great of a leader we are is how high we'll rise, but it's really our limitations. I mean, we call them limitations because they hold us back from things. And so that's really what the Peter principle is sort of identifying. Is it not? Yeah. So it's this idea that you will rise to the level of your incompetence. So what, to some degree, Whatever position you have ascended to, if, especially particularly if you've been there for a period of time, that's a signal that that's actually as high as you could possibly go. Mm. Because generally people will, will keep being promoted up until the point that they become incompetent. I know that's, a, again, a very challenging thing to hear maybe. And the word incompetent is, is tough. It sounds, like, it sounds like a very harsh thing to say or it sounds like stupid or it sounds like incapable of anything yeah. or incompetent it just means like you get to a point where you no longer can play the game at a higher level yeah and and that's just a fact like think of it in terms of sports right you people continue to ascend the ranks of sports up until the point where they are no longer good enough to keep moving forward if, right. you, if you were to think of it in that like that doesn't mean you can't shoot hoops but like you can't ball with LeBron, right? Like you're not at that level. You rose to the level of your incompetence. For me, that level was reached maxed out in the seventh grade. So like (laughs) your your basketball competency. That's right. Yeah. I was, I was bench warming in seventh grade. So I never, (laughs) I didn't get that far in the first place. Yeah. Um, But that's true for us in leadership. If it's true in sports, it's true in other things too. And it's certainly true in leadership. Yeah, and it's not like, you know, there's only five professional basketball players in, in across the league. There's hundreds of them, you know. So even among them, I mean, there, there are those whose names you may rarely hear uttered by a newscaster. Um, and then there's others that are household names regardless of whether you follow basketball or not or any other sport. So they're all professional basketball players and they've reached a certain level. Others have certainly gone higher. Same is true in the church. There's pastors all over the world. They've all reached that professional ministry status. Um, But then there's going to be some that have excelled, you know, in in higher capacities. Uh, They maybe they lead churches that have become well known or, you know, they're they're very large, those kinds of things. Not that large is better. Just saying there's people also in ministry who have risen to very high levels and are very well known, especially, you know, in in the church context. Um, But you know, for every one of those, there's 5,000 others that nobody will ever know their name. Um, and not that they're not leading their church as well, but there's just pastors at all levels, just like there are business people and athletes. Yeah. And I think one of the key points we want to make, especially here on the Church Revitalization podcast, is that, uh, like AJ said, our goal is not for your church to be bigger or the biggest. Um, but really the healthiest that it can be. And the reality yeah. is that all of us rise to the level of our incompetence. And so we are kind of have to take on our own shoulders the unhealth that surrounds us. So one of the, one of the mistakes that we make, and we'll, we'll talk about more, about more about this in a minute, but one of the mistakes that we make is that we blame the dysfunction that's around us on factors other than us. Mm. But if we're the, the ones leading the organization and have been doing so for a period of time and things aren't what we think that they should be or could be, there's a really good chance that the problem is you. 
um, or at least that it starts with you. And so the solution then is also starting with you. So yeah. we want to talk about how can you raise your leadership ceiling, not so that you can become you know, the next Billy Graham, but so that you can make your church the healthiest that it can be. Um, because wherever your church is, it could always be better um, and always be more effective and always be reaching more for the kingdom of God. And so that's what yeah. we want to help you do. Uh, how can you raise your leadership ceiling is the question. We've got three points we'll make for you to, uh, this week. Uh, the first one, Scott, is that you need to be self-aware of what your ceiling is right now. Um, so you can't, you can't start fixing things until you identify what needs to be fixed. So uh, you've got to start with some close self-assessment. Yeah, so uh, you know this this ties in a little bit with uh, I think it was back in episode forty five I believe we were talking about um, emotional intelligence and this yeah. uh, this concept of self awareness. Um, this is sort of an expansion of that same idea, but rather than just uh, self awareness in regards to your emotions, this is self awareness in terms of your um, ability to lead. So I I've, meet, I've met a lot of pastors in my work um, that. If I'm, if we're all just being honest, like it's just us, it's just, just me, you, AJ, and whoever's listening. Okay, there's a lot of us who feel like if you if you were just to like something, Andy Stanley had to go on an extended vacation at North Point, and uh, you know you just stuck me in that position, I could do what he does. Yeah, I mean, no one would. I don't know that anybody would ever verbalize that, but I think sort of intrinsically, a lot of us feel like, hey, if I was in his shoes, I could probably do what he's doing. And the reality is, I don't think you could. I don't think I could. Yeah, you know what I mean. I mean, Andy's an exceptional leader. Um, he's got way more experience than than me and you probably listening. And he's been through things and experienced things that we haven't, and um, led through challenging things. And I'm not putting anybody down, but you have to understand what your limitations are as a leader and go, okay, either, either a limitation based on experience, like I've not walked that journey before, so I can't know how to handle those things. And also just knowing your limitations in terms of skill. Like, have you managed hundreds of staff before? Do you know how to break them into teams to develop them, to manage the HR implications of that, to cast vision for tens of thousands of people? Do you know how to communicate every week and do that really well online and do you know how to like do you can you do all those things can you just yeah. step into that i mean i don't know i think the first step if you really wanted to re redefine it's just humility and going okay yeah <laughs> i can't do it all so i think the, the the first thing is to really recognize what your ceiling is and to start um well we'll talk more about this in a second but really just start identifying that in like specifically what specifically is your ceiling not just generally like oh i know i couldn't be andy stanley but what what specifically is your ceiling what are those things that are holding you down yeah yeah look back at you know your last few pastorates um you know i mean if you've you've been in ministry 30 years have yeah. have the have the last several moves that you've made pretty much been lateral um if, you know, if so, you maybe you've kind of settled in to, to where your ceiling may be. Um, and again, yeah. not, we're not putting you down for that. We're, um, it, it also still you know, depends on what your own personal desires might be, what you believe the Holy Spirit's leading you to do in your own leadership capacity um, and you know, the, the level of ministry that you're going to engage in. So uh, you know, if you want to, if you feel called to, have a desire to increase your ceiling, to increase maybe the capacity of your ministry, then uh, as we move you know, through this episode, we'll identify some areas in which you can do that. Um, for others, perhaps you really feel like I'm in my sweet spot right now. And you don't have a desire to be an Andy Stanley uh, or a Rick Warren or, or even the pastor down the street at the 2000 member church. So yeah. um, you know, there's, there's places for everyone in the kingdom. And we're not, we're not here to try to make you into something that God does not have for you to be. Yeah, I think, um, sorry, if you were watching on the, if you're watching the podcast, you were like, what is Scott doing? Standing Scott up, is turning around, not, engaged here. not paying attention. Uh, it's because I was trying to find this book on my shelf, Sticky Teams, a 
it's a great book. You should check it out sometime. It's not a it's not a Malfer's book, but listen, we're equal opportunity promoters of other people's books here. Um, one of the analogies he uses in this book, and I was actually trying to find it because it, I think it's really helpful. Um, he talks about understanding what game are we playing. That's the actually chapter four. It's called "What Game Are We Playing." He talks about the idea of how you, as you move through certainly church sizes, but really. It's about the leadership game changes. And so um, I, it evolves from the track star, like you're the solo pastor and you know, you're kind of just moving things along to golfing buddies. It's like you and, you and another guy or a couple guys kind of making decisions on a team to the basketball team uh, where it's what, is that five guys on a court, six guys, no, how many people play? I'm the wrong person to ask. Five. I, I think you. it's five, right? Because if someone's the sixth man, then they're the one who's, who's good, who subs in. Oh. Look at us talking about sports things. This, this uh, is not ESPN. Yeah. Uh, and then moving up to the football team, like it talks about, he talks about how the complexity increases exponentially as you increase the size of the team. So, he talks about how lines of communication, for example, um, in, increase uh, exponentially as you add team members. So this is on page 71. I'll just, this is fantastic. So he's, you know, when you have two people or programs, that's two lines of communication. Three people or programs, that's six lines of communication. Four people or programs, 12 lines of communication. You know, by the time you get to six people, six people on staff, um, that could be full time or part time, or you have six programs. That's thirty lines of communication. Some of you are leading churches that have, uh, you know, thirty, forty ministries, or you've got sixteen. AJ and I were just talking about a, a church board that has sixteen members on a church board. Think about how many lines of communication that is. And so, to one degree, you're managing complexity. For other of you, you're trying to manage uh, a golfing buddies type situation as if it's a football team. So you got to know, you got to play the game appropriately to the size that you are and to the situation you are and the, comp the level of complexity that makes sense. Yeah. So I don't know. It's a great book, Sticky Teams, and it speaks to this sort of understanding the game that you're playing and, and playing the game appropriately for the level that you're at. And that speaks to this idea of leadership ceilings. Yeah. Yep. So that's this first, that's his first point is be being able to take yourself through an honest assessment of, uh, of where you are and considering where is it you really want to be. Uh, if you're not happy in your present position or level of leadership capacity, level of leadership teaching that you're, that you feel capable of doing. Um, if you feel like you need to be raising leaders in your church and that just hasn't been able to happen for several years, uh, and we have a lot of these conversations. I know, Oh, if I just had more leaders, you know, really, I would love to like to do this, but I just don't have the people uh, that would lead that, those things. Well, a lot of that comes from your capacity to train up other leaders. So that's, I mean, that is a, that's a level of capacity in leadership is your ability to replicate yourself. So yeah. if you're finding yourself in these, in these positions, um, then you need to identify that. And, you know, this has got to be listed out. Uh, where am I today? Um, and that kind of leads us into number two here, Scott. We, you've got down that you need to target your limiting beliefs, behaviors, and ignorance. So mm -hmm. that, and that, those three items right there actually may be good, um, you know, as a part of your self-assessment from our first point, consider um, as you assess yourself, your beliefs, behaviors, and it, level of ignorance, understanding also you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so that, that may have to first come from some reading or really take, having a close look also at other leaders maybe that you admire or who have excelled in leadership. But so to restate number two here, you need to target your limiting beliefs, behaviors, and ignorance. Yeah. So I would say uh, I give one example in the, in the article that you'll read at malfordsgroup.com forward slash 47. But, um, Another example that I, I could share is that uh, a limiting uh, behavior in my own leadership is that, and AJ can attest to this one, I'm really great at ideas, like really great at coming in. Here is something that we should do. And, it, and I can 
sell why it's so important and I can sell how it would make a really big impact for us organizationally. And this has been true of me from the time I've started leading anything. Um, but a limiting behavior of mine is I can get easily get sidetracked by the next idea and then get bored with an idea. So, you know, for me, I have to be self-aware. Like, and I, that, that involves two things. One I have to really figure out, is this actually a good idea? Like, is this, because if, you know, if I'm going to share it, you're, I'm kind of going to speak, because I'm a leader in the organization, if I share this idea, then I'm speaking life to it, depending on the context, right? And I maybe am getting a ball rolling in a particular direction. So I probably shouldn't share the idea unless I'm convinced that it actually is a good one. That really could bring benefit and life and distance to the organization. I should, otherwise, I should just hold it in because chances are a week later, I will have forgotten about it and moved on anyway. <laughs> but if it's an idea I can't let go of and go, man, this is a really good one. I got to share it, then share it. Two, I have to recognize when I'm starting to get distracted and get my eye off the ball and either refocus myself or get help and say, hey, all right, you know, maybe delegate something or whatever like i've got to find ways to sustain it to the to the finish line mm -hmm. when i start to get distracted there's this great scene in parks and rec do you watch parks and rec aj i used to not i haven't seen an episode in quite a long time but there's a scene where um leslie nope is talking to uh, chris pratt's character and she's telling him about like where to find something like, okay, quick, go to my office. You're going to go to the, to the shelf that's on the left and there's a drawer in there and you're going to open the drawer. You got to sort to this thing. And she's telling him and you know, where to find this thing. And he's watching. And then as she, she keeps explaining and you're not, if you're not watching the podcast, you won't see this, but uh, you know, she, she keeps explaining where it is. And he just starts to, his eyes just start to drift off and look away at something else. And she's like, Andy, you know, she's trying to get his attention. And that's like, that's, that's me. Like I, as you get further into the implementation of something, I just, my eyes start to drift off. And so like, that's a limiting behavior and I have to know that. So, um, I don't know, AJ, would you like to share? Do you have anything that you'd like to share? Or is this uh, going to just be the Scott Ball <laughs> confession of limitations? I think we're here to, to talk about your limitations, Scott, <laughs> not mine. Uh, oh, sh I mean, sure, yeah. Well, you know what? As, as I mean, we and we've actually talked even, I think, about like that exact thing that uh, on previous episodes, and we've had this conversation over and over. It's kind of a running joke that you have all these ideas. Um, on our team. And I love that about you. And that's why you're such a valuable uh, part of TMG as well. But you're also a great compliment to me because that I am not typically, I'm not the weekly idea guy. I'm just not. Um, and so that's why, why I so value that that is a part of you. Um, I mean, you know, I think one of my strengths is not just saying every idea is the best idea. And we spread ourselves too thin. So I'm able to kind of, you know, maybe rein you in a little bit um, and think maybe critically through like, how would that play out? What, what are all the parts right. to that? Um, yeah. So, you know, I and, well, and I would say like of, early on in my leadership, I would, I maybe would have been. And so this is just kind of talking about leadership feelings. Like when I was 20, you know, or 25, heck, even 30, like I probably would have been offended if someone didn't think something was a great idea <laughs> because I'm thoroughly convinced that every idea I have is a great idea. Yeah. You know, I know that's, that's like, that's immature, right? But you know, if we trust me, if any of you are listening and you're an idea person, you know what it's like, you're like, no, 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 this, this is, this is gold right here. Like this idea is gold. Yeah. Um, and you know, as you get to, if you want to break through that leadership ceiling though, you have to go, all right, I need people in my life. Who are going to be who are going to poke holes in your great ideas? Yeah, and and not be offended by that and go, okay, yeah, maybe this wasn't a great idea. Yeah, well, I mean, conversely, for me, I think as I've increased in maturity, because I used to be much more arrogant than I am now, and would probably have been maybe like you've partially described here. If I have an idea, it's the best idea, and everybody should want to do it. So I've certainly had to learn that over my life. So I think part of you know, maybe my arrogance or ignorance was that, you know what, other people have good ideas and it's good to, to listen to different points of view, to gather 
lots of information to come up with some data points so that we can make a good decision as a team. And so, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, in the end, um, I, I think we've ended up being a really great ministry partnership um, as we lead TMG together. So um, our, our strengths and weaknesses have managed to meld together. <laughs> yeah. So I think from a, to kind of move forward. So you want to identify like, what are those things? And that's just one example. I could, if we wanted to spend all day kind of doing a deep dive into all the limitations of my personal leadership, we could certainly do that. But I think it'd uh, be more productive for you to think through what are those things for you? What are those things? Maybe it's delegation. Maybe it's a hot temper. That's another example that I give in the, in the thing. Cause I can, I can have that. Um, you want to think, what are those things that you have problems with? And, be able to name it and then also begin to start working through it. So something we talk about in the article and I kind of want to make mention here is that your leadership decisions actually come from the instinctual part of your brain, um, not from sort of that front frontal lobe cortex where you're, where you're sort of actively making decisions. It actually, mm-hmm. most of your leadership, I mean, like if you're sitting in a meeting, maybe like a brainstorming meeting, maybe those kinds of decisions are coming out of, of your, the most well-developed part of your brain. But most of your leadership decisions, the, the conversations in the hallway, the way you react in a board meeting, the, what you do, how you act on a Sunday morning, how you react to conflict, these things come from the instinctual part of your brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can be retrained, but you, you have to consciously work on that. So... Um, the example that we we talk about in the article I mentioned here is, um, you know, the best here, I guess this has become a basketball episode, but, um, you know, the best basketball players, they don't just practice their free throws, you know, in practice on the court. They practice them in their mind. They, you know, they're visualizing making that every time. And I would know this because I'm very good at making free throws. I'm just kidding. Um, but in all seriousness, this is, might sound stupid, but you should daydream about your weaknesses in leadership. Like, play it out. I will, again, just fully confessing here, if I have a new idea, I don't necessarily like daydream about the conversation I'm going to have with AJ. About, about something, but I try to p- play things to their logical conclusion. Does that yeah. make sense? So if I have an idea, I'm going to go, okay, let me think this one through. Let me... Let's think through all the, the subsequent steps that would happen. Um, and then and that helps me to make a determination. Is this something that I should speak about and move forward on, or I should just kind of shelve it and move forward? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so that way you're retraining your brain so that every time I have an idea, I don't call AJ up on Zoom and say, hey, I have an idea. You're like, you've got to work things through in your brain so that it becomes more instinctual to act the way in a way that lifts your leadership ceiling. Retraining your instinct. And, and I think that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting kind of thing to consider. So between instinct and maybe more rational thought, rational behavior, we're really talking about getting in touch with your instincts, determining maybe where there's some flaw or where an increase in capacity could take place. And then attempting to retrain your own instincts. And, and it made me think of my dog, who, you know, whenever I go to let her out back, if there's a squirrel, her instinct is to chase the squirrel. And, you know, instead of going over, we don't have a fence, but she's become trained enough where she kind of goes just a little bit away from the house. And then I've got like a line that I can, uh, like a little dog run that I can hook her up to on her collar. And so 99% of the time, she's great. Put her out there. She goes, you know, within reach of the line, I can walk out there, hook her up and she's great. But if there's a squirrel, she may go further than I want her to go. And now I have to run and, and I don't want to run. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, obviously there's plenty of really well-trained dogs out there. When they see a squirrel, they, their natural instinct to chase a squirrel is overridden by what they've been trained to do. And that is to not chase squirrels. So uh, same thing with us. Once we understand what our instinctual behavior is, then we can we can decide then rationally through the, the gift of human thought that God has given us how mm-hmm. we want to behave and begin to work on that. Um, one of which I will segue into point number three, 
Scott, um, the title is get a better mentor or coach, not get a mentor or coach because we've already had them, haven't we? That's right. Yeah. There's no such thing as a self-made leader. Those don't exist. Um, you know, the leadership that, that you have today is a direct reflection of the bosses and the parents and the teachers and the professors and the pastors and the others who have led you. So, um, if you've only ever been under weak leaders, that's maybe a tough thing to hear, but if you've only ever served under weak leaders, uh, it's not likely for, that you're going to be a strong leader. Um, now, I, I don't want to say that uh, there is this sort of like debate. Is leadership you know, uh, taught yeah. is, or, or is born. it in, or born? And the reality is it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, but generally, natural born leaders have the roughest edges. So they tend to have the worst extremes. So somebody who has like natural leadership tendencies also generally has tendencies towards toxic behavior. Mm. And so even folks with natural born leadership skills need good mentorship um, above them to soften their raw edges. They tend to be bombastic. They can be um, bulldozers. They can be uh, you know, we've all seen the examples of, of, a, of a, someone who has n raw, natural leadership talent fail out of ministry miserably because of the devastating mistakes they made. So uh, the best leaders know how to follow. And you need to find people to follow that you respect and who have been places you haven't and who are good leaders. So you need to find better leaders. It is sort of a common saying that, you know, you are the sum of the three or four people you spend the most time with. And if you look around at the three or four people you're spending the most time with from a leadership perspective, and they're kind of bums or ineffective, and then you look at yourself, and I'm not saying you're a bum, but you look and you go, I'm maybe not particularly effective. You yeah. should not be shocked by that. Yeah. You know, get yourself in the room with people who have been somewhere you haven't, who have done things that you haven't who've been further down the road than you have and catch leadership from them. Yeah. If you've been paying attention to those people around you, you've likely seen out of any particular person, either things about them in which you appreciate and would like to emulate or things about them you do not appreciate and would hope for yourself to not emulate. Uh, and then there's that middle ground of our instinct in which we just kind of, we take things in subconsciously and, and it builds us into who we are and we kind of ride in that space without really any conscious thought about it. Um, so it does take this introspective approach to leadership development to really see where am I today? What are the things I'm intentionally trying to do that are good? What are the, the things I'm intentionally trying not to do that are not good? And where is my, my subconscious leadership at? in which I've, I've got to really get in touch. And sometimes that also comes from maybe uh, like 360 evaluations, which you can get some feedback from other people, um, either you know, below your position, above your position, uh, your spouse, family members, those kinds of things to help maybe open up into your conscious what has been uh, subconscious or unconscious in your, in your leadership ceiling. Yeah. So um, let me just recap real quick these, these kind of three points that we made here. First is becoming self-aware about where your ceiling is now. Um, and the second point maybe being um, a couple of good categories in which to self-assess. And that's targeting any limiting beliefs or behaviors or maybe a level of ignorance in which you're simply operating um, in a, an unknowing state. And then finally, number three, getting a better mentor or coach where you're being intentional about surrounding yourself with people in which you would want to emulate, people that are successful and that are doing things well so that uh, you can begin to operate at that capacity also. Right. Um, and successful in the ways that you want. So, yeah. you know, it, may not, it doesn't necessarily mean, again, a numerical success. It, mm -hmm. it, it can be that they, you know, if, if you're a hothead, get yourself in the room with someone who's not a hothead and yeah. learn how they handle conflict, you know? Um, so, or if you're someone who is like distracted by squirrels, again, get in the room with people who are really good at project management and finishing things like mm -hmm. get in the room with people who are further ahead in the things that you want to expand your horizons. I was um, just last week working with a church and um, I mean, the power of these relationships is really important. Um, 
and uh, I was taking them through a systems mapping process and a strategy objective development. And, uh, and the pastor said to me, now that we've gone through this process, I honestly don't know what we were doing before. It was like we were stumbling through a room in the dark. And when you have a partner, like, you know, whether it's just friends you know in ministry or you're working with someone like us, we've seen things that you've not seen because we see it again and again and again and again and again. When you can, when you can hitch your, your wagon to somebody who's seen things you haven't, been places you haven't, done things you've not done, it can get you further faster. And, you know, leverage the power of community and relationship to increase your leadership ceiling. And that's what really happens. That's how to do it. That's great. Well, thanks for uh, another great topic this week, Scott. And uh, we're thankful for you for joining us on the Church Revitalization Podcast. You've been listening to episode 47. And today's article can be found at malfordgroup.com slash 47. Uh, you can also watch this on our YouTube channel. This will be up on Facebook. If you don't follow the Malfords Group on Facebook, then uh, head on over there because that's going to be always the up to, up to minute place in which we have content out there for you. And we're thankful for your ministry. God bless you. And uh, we'll see you back next week.